It was the age when the banners of the tribes had been coated in dust, gradually losing their color. And before the throne stands a half-man, holding a cracked ring, playing with preeminence. For a land of heroes and champions, Natlan is ever more the nation to propose the idea of tournaments in the name of war. However, despite their changed nature, their histories still tell of a glorious legend which speaks the names of the past. To tell the story is to get into the lore for the unfinished Reverie artifact set, which adds more to the timeline of Tevat's events. Get ready as we unpack the legends behind a Saurian and red-eyed hero which toppled the empire of a tyrant king in the lands of Natlan. In telling this artifact story, I suppose it's best to start from the flower and so on. To begin, Natlan at this point is ruled by a king or a half-man as noted in the story. This king has since gone mad and become a tyrant. A red-eyed youth returned from the kingdom where water flowed as rays of light, which it's assumed to be Remoria given that the domain, Faded Theater, has this description. With the passage of time, the ancient place became legend, until one day, by chance, it was deliberately picked up once more and became the prelude to a new dream. When he returns, an old woman suddenly appears before him and reveals the horrors made by the Tyrant King. She describes the kingdom as a land of death piled high with the skulls of behemoths, these behemoths being the dragons. Combined with hints and the other pieces, the king has also killed numerous tribesmen, so the old woman encourages the red-eyed youth to call for a death squad with which to dethrone the tyrant. One by one, volunteers began to appear before the red-eyed youth, recognizing his past actions, as this red-eyed youth was not just an ordinary local, but a savior of the Saurians. This is why a lot of volunteers came to help this hero, his team was comprised as such. At first, it was a girl named Sakuk who scouts out information for him. She's described to be part bird or maybe part Saurian due to the quote, she sought out information for the youth like Quetzal. As a fun fact, Quetzals are birds which Mayans and Aztecs once used as symbols of having a high status. So anyways, the next to arrive were twins. The older was named Atahualpa with a sharp tongue, and the younger but stronger was named Huascar. Fourth and the last to arrive was a warrior named Yupankui, who sides with them upon learning that this red-eyed youth wants to save the Saurians once again. For now, the red-eyed boy is unnamed but it could be revealed soon enough. So after assembling this team, he suddenly recalls the rumors of a craftsman who knows all the passages in the city and can disarm all its traps and so wants to find him as their first step. So as a continuation to the story, the red-eyed boy ordered Sakuk to try and find the craftsman. She looked far to any distance but to no avail, however when she looked at this feather, she recalled that it was a keepsake from her father. Suddenly, a drunk with half his face burnt came before her and started describing it in intimate detail. Suddenly, a surprise came to her thought. This drunk was the master craftsman she was looking for. The master craftsman retells the story about his time working for someone respected by all. Saku confirms that this was her father and was killed by the king for defending the Saurians. Seeing how sad she reacted towards the story of her father's death, the craftsman agrees to follow her. By the last quote, it reveals that there is an ongoing romance behind Sakuk and the red-eyed boy. It describes how the craftsman fell in love at first sight with Sakuk, but her heart already belonged to someone else. In this part of the story, it now focuses on the uprising. Sakuk acted as a representative of the six original tribes, as described in the talking stick, and convinced them to re-ally themselves with the Saurians. She also sent the wandering spirits back to the realm of the night, which is hard to understand what this meant, but maybe she was also an exorcist similar to Shenhe and Changyun. 
Anyways, during the battle within the city, Yupan Kui freed the Saurian. Specifying one in particular makes us guess that this could be the Pyro Dragon Sovereign. Oddly, this act made those who came from the spring stores believed it was a time for those who had forgotten their past to listen anew to the echoes of the waves. It can be theorized that this was a tribe which focuses on the element of Hydro and could have come from Fontaine originally. Maybe a group of dragons which migrated to Nautilun and formed a new tribe. As for the next to happen, Atewalpa rallied the people of the city and those not yet allied to the Red-Eyed Boys' Rebellion while Waskar fought the Torrent of Darkness. For this Torrent of Darkness, the Talking Stick also refers to this, which could be the Abyss or some form of forbidden knowledge. Meanwhile, as this was happening, the Red-Eyed Boy uses the God's Fiery Wrath, which could indicate that he has a pyrovision that burns the city thus restoring peace to the tribes. Despite being the brains behind the operation, the master craftsman went unnamed in history. He remembers seeing an image of a black shadow shrouding the sun, which could hint that he has ties to Conria's Eclipse dynasty. This also tells us that this story happened a long time ago, even before the cataclysm happened 500 years ago. By the end of this uprising, the craftsman comes up to the red-eyed boy and tells of his time working for the former king. Underground, he excavated gargantuan beastly constructs whose wings once caught the winds, which hints that this craftsman was tasked with digging up and reverse engineering Conria tech. But because the king was already growing insane, the king ordered to bury these secrets as well as those with knowledge of it. The craftsman must have found something for the king to respond by burning everyone involved, burying all together with the ruins behind the stone gate. This stone gate possibly being another doorway to Conria as similar to the one in Sumeru. As we know, the artisan survived the king's orders, but mentions a golden tear falling from a stone statue into his own eye, giving him visions of elaborate machines and shadows climbing up to the moon. Now, the tear appears to be forbidden knowledge, given it concerns high tech and the sky. Climbing up to the moon might mean he saw something about the three moon sisters or the false sky too. The tear being golden calls to mind Azosit, the name for the Conrians' power source. Perhaps they had a liquid form at one point. However, calling the drop a tear specifically calls to mind Deshwart who also dabbled in forbidden knowledge. If all of this happened in Simuru, it wouldn't be surprising if the craftsmen and the research team of the Tyrant King discovered some stuff from the ruins along with them to study as they excavated Conrius stuff. But surprisingly, the craftsmen saw more than just high tech. In truth, he had seen far more in those flames that had nearly rendered his life as ash, such as flowing golden patterns, another path to escape from the ruins, as well as the manifold iron rules that had established the empire that stretched far and wide. Those descriptions from the craftsmen seem to give us an idea that Celestia controls people through fate, such as their fake constellations. It appears this uprising caused by the red-eyed boy was his attempt to subvert the fate of tribes of Nadlon, much like how Remus composed his symphony to free his people from the prophecy. In any case, the craftsman resolved to tell everyone the full story once the new kingdom is up and running, as he plans to build a strong wall for the new king. Coming down to the last piece, by this part of the story, it is set well after everything else with Sakuk, the only one still alive. The red-eyed hero returned to the sacred flames after completing his calling, which seems to be a physical thing since Yupan Kui also followed him in. So, maybe it is Natlan's version of Ascension, similar to what happened with Vanessa in Mondstadt. Unfortunately for Waskar, he died in battle, which drove his brother at the Walpa to madness. He soon died later on. In the end, Sakuk spent the years buying as many of the craftsmen's creations as possible, including fakes to protect his reputation while punishing the fraudsters in secret. One day, she placed the circlet on a tree, took the few genuine articles and items of her dead friends, and disappeared, which assumes she went to her death, with those left behind swearing to swipe the craftsman's name from history. 
This gives reason as to why the craftsman wasn't named elsewhere in the story, due to how the remaining tribesmen of Sakuk erased his name. While Sakuk was preparing for a final walk, she remembers the red-eyed hero as someone she loved, and the remains of her dead friends, thinking how among all of them, she was the one left to live such a long life. And so there ends the story of the red-eyed hero, Sakuk, the master craftsman, and their friends who restored peace to the tribal nature of Natlan. Just to share, reading these stories about the legends of Natlan makes us more excited about the region. Still, I hope you enjoyed more of this info about Natlan. Thank you very much for watching, and as usual, we are Clementine. Until the next one, be safe and stay tuned.